Also joining us from Jones Lang LaSalle is Brian Sparks. He is a managing director and broker uh, focused on the Boston market. From uh, Gensler is Patricia Nobry, who is a senior associate and director of the strategy lab at Gensler. Um, and finally, joining us today from MIT is John Alvarez, the director of campus planning. Really excited that we could get these um, folks to volunteer their time. And as I mentioned, bring in a, a pretty diverse set of viewpoints around this topic. Um, I think as many of us know, the pandemic has really forced a questioning of the, the kind of role and value of the physical office space. Um, it certainly has accelerated a lot of existing trends around remote working and even e-commerce. And I think that, you know, from my own perspective, uh, as someone concerned with space a lot, um, the, the topic of workplace seems to be very inherently tied to the pandemic and the cultural implications of what's happened over the last year. I, I know a lot of our clients and, and even internally are asking questions of, about, you know, how much space will we need in the future? Is it less? Is it, is it going to be more? Are we doing hybrid work models? What does hoteling look like? There's so many questions that surround workplace that have come out of the last 12 months and the kind of um, rethinking of what implications to um, our attitudes about workplace are going to remain with us in the, in the future. And, um, you know, I began uh, last summer thinking about I work with our workplace clients a lot, but my higher ed clients, how is this going to begin to impact their world? Um, how are they dealing with this? How do their physical space characteristics and concerns um, mirror those of the corporate workplace? And so that was sort of the genesis for this talk today is to really um, engage some viewpoints from the corporate real estate side to understand certain trends and what's happening um, look at in more detail from the workplace design standpoint, how these types of changes and attitudes may affect our, our working environments going forward. And, and finally, you know, from the viewpoint of, of and, and John today, you know, how is this in a, in a real world right now impacting what's going on with planning and considerations around office space, whether it's consolidation or transformation. So um, that's really enough out of me. Um, I just want to, again, thank everyone for joining us today. And, and I'd like to start really by um, asking J Julia, um, you know, what are you, what are you seeing out there from, from a broad sense in terms of the kinds of changes in, in the corporate real estate market around workplace? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's no doubt been a very interesting and illuminating and challenging year for everybody. And, you know, what what's become apparent and what really you know after we started to settle into working from home largely after those first few weeks of the pandemic was a realization that a lot of the conversations we were having with our clients were actually a continuation of trends that we had started to see pre-pandemic and i make that point because i think it's an important one that we're not necessarily going in a completely different direction than we were a year ago but there's been an emphasis placed on things like collaboration and work-life balance and health and well-being in the workplace that are now, I think, getting the, uh, the attention and the level of importance that they should have had beforehand. Um, you know, when Brian and I are meeting with occupier clients before the pandemic, uh, uh, nine times out of 10, the conversations that we were having when we were talking about their space needs were, we need more team rooms. We need more collaboration space. We've got a boardroom that sits 50 people that's used once a year and all those other times in between, it's teams of two, three, four, and five that are reserving this giant boardroom. So what we actually need is a lot more collaboration space. Now, 12 months later into the pandemic, we're hearing people saying, we want our office to be the location where people can come back in for collaboration. We're calling them collaboration centers. We're calling them places where they can gather them scatter. And so I think, you know, the, the positive impact um, or the silver lining, if you will, is that we are now valuing, you know, the right things, I think, in the workplace. Um, 
from a, a research perspective in my seat where I sit, we have been doing a lot of corporate surveys um, over the past 12 months, really trying to understand what has been the progression of this crisis and then, um, you know, kind of the, the business continuity over the last 12 months. And it really was initially around crisis management, getting people to shift to a work from home and figuring out how to work together. And then kind of the euphoria of this is amazing. I'm home. I, I don't have to get dressed into real clothes every day. I might have some, you know, more opportunity to exercise during the day to now what we're starting to hear a lot more of. And, you know, you guys can all raise your hand if you feel this is work from home fatigue, Zoom fatigue, the, the, um, <laughs> thank you, Chloe <laughs> and David, the um, complete diminishing of work life balance because you're not quite sure when to log off for the day and, um, you know, when to log on. I, I was talking to somebody this morning and he said, when I wake up in the morning, I see my laptop and it's just staring at me. And I just have to open it right when I get out of bed. And so I think all of these things have highlighted much needed improvement to the workplace. And, um, you know, when we're, again, going back to some of our surveys, what we're hearing right now, and then I'll pause, is um, we're at about 12% of in-office occupancy nationally. Um, if you look at that, that kind of segmentation geographically, you're going to see some of the states that have reopened at higher levels of capacity are having higher levels of occupancy, which makes sense. Um, those of us who are still in more restricted um, markets or where we're heavily reliant on public transportation, we see lower occupancy levels. Um, we have seen the shift from 90% of our clients saying that they don't want to redesign their space at the beginning of the pandemic to now 50% uh, saying they do and they plan to de-densify. And as, as it relates to your earlier point, Michael, around hybrid work, um, pre-pandemic around 12% of the labor market worked from home full-time. Now we're hearing from our clients that, that they plan to allow you know, up to 20% of their employees to work from home, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to shed 20% of their real estate footprint because they need to accommodate different work schedules more collaboration space and de-densification. So we're hearing, you know, around 10% of, of some companies, not all, because there are definitely sectors that have been booming during this pandemic, but for those that have contemplated reducing their footprint, it's around 10%. Yeah, that's a really interesting point um, about the, you know, the reduction of footprint, because I think there, there was a lot of, um, thought initially that um, as, as, as work from home accelerated that a lot of um, kind of corporate um, companies that have, you know, a, a, a more considerable um, real estate footprint or a portfolio campus, you know, how would this impact them? Or are they going to consolidate? You know, I've, I've, heard, I've heard different companies and different approaches about that. And I think that has an interesting implication for a higher ed. So I, I was wondering if, from Brian's perspective um, and, and with you know, more of a focus locally, are, are you seeing um, you know, a, a kind of corporate disposition around consolidation and the reduction of their real estate footprint? I didn't realize I could unmute myself, Michael. That's a, uh, that's a dangerous thing for you to disable. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I mean, from April through present day, we've seen close to 3 million square feet of subway space come on the market across the 70 million square feet that is the, the downtown Boston market. So yeah, that number seems staggering, but you're, you're still only talking three, 4%. Um, and, but you know, it, at the end of the day, uh, irrespective of what the market has done from a fundamental standpoint, new supply, lower demand, uh, we haven't seen a dramatic shift in pricing. Um, and I think that there's a disconnect between what tenants expect to be the case based on the last 13 months of living through this and what the reality is in the market. So um, to, to hit your question directly, there has been a, uh, a rise in dispositions. Some of that was done because groups like, you know, site Toast and Wayfair, um, who both put big chunks of space on the market. We were seeing a situation where 
fast growing companies were starting to take space defensively just in the couple of years leading up to COVID. And I think if we look back historically, uh, we all have such short term memories. Um, we, we probably see a lot of the things coming into this crisis, while nobody could predict what it was going to be, that are the same things we saw in other crises. Um, people were taking space defensively, the market was running, we were battling um, a lot of the factors we have no control over, but we're ultimately kind of a, a byproduct of our success as a market in terms of our challenges with recruitment, uh, commuting. So. Um, yeah, we saw a bunch of space dumped on the market. Some of it was done because it was just excess that big users didn't have any intentions of going back to. Some of it was done opportunistically, um, and that was prim primarily in the technology sector. We, about 45% of the overall sublease space that hit the market was in the TAMI sector. So a lot of these tech companies that said, hey, we don't think we're going to be back in the office for the next year, so why are we going to continue to pay for it? Um, we don't know what our footprint's going to be. We don't know how our people are going to work. They're still grappling with those questions. So they put their space out proactively. We're starting to see some of those spaces come off the market because as people are planning for reoccupancy, the opportunity for um, for disposing of their space uh, may be passed. Um, and then we, you know, unfortunately saw not a great percentage, but a bunch of companies that just that went out of business. And so their spaces went on the sublease market and are ultimately going back to the landlord on a direct basis. Um, so that's hopefully that covers your question around the disposition side, Michael. Yeah, no, thank you. It, it certainly does. I mean, and beyond that kind of consolidation consideration, are you seeing any other, I guess, kind of trends that that you think are gonna to continue to shape sort of the corporate real estate market as, as we go forward and their attitudes about the, the role of, of physical office space? Yeah, I, I, I'm bullish. <laughs> we kind of have to be um, on the way people are going to use space in the future and, and, and its you know reversal to pre-pandemic tendencies. Um, yeah, I, I think that we've seen the evolution in our, in our client discussions from, as Julia said, the, the the triage early on to the uncertainty to hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now and some of that uncertainty unraveling into planning. Um, I can tell you that majority of our clients are still in the mid innings. And I know a lot of people on, these call, on this call are probably helping those clients work through their planning. The reality is none of us know what the right decision is gonna be. Um, you know, we, we model these scenarios until we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, there's still uncertainty. Um, and what we try to tell our clients is that um, you know, flexibility is gonna be the key. Um, and that's flexibility in where you work. So it's accommodating the people that wanna work from home um, as well as flexibility within the office. So, uh, you know, you've a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of our teammates, you know, who are younger and, you know, may, may not have great work from home setups as some others do, have been working on their couch, have been working at their kitchen table. What's to say that they're gonna to wanna to be tethered to a desk when they come back to the office? So it's flexibility, where you work, how you work. Um, and then I think the collaboration aspect of things is gonna be, uh, is gonna be critical because I, I do think that it, there's going to be, as Julia said, a certain percentage of hiring that's gonna be done strictly remote. And that's good because we were hitting a lot of barriers to our growth as a market with the tapped out talent pool, um, particularly highly technical talent. So it's great for companies to be able to, to recruit and for people to be able to move where they want. But I think that the, the notion of collaboration uh, is gonna be really strained when we're finally giving employees the option to come back to the office and some are choosing to do it and others aren't. And we start to get this haves and have nots potentially through breakdowns in technology uh, when we're not all on the same playing field, right? I mean, we're all, some are in their offices, some are not but we're all generally remote right now and we're hosting this forum in a remote setting. When, you know, when David is sitting in the office with three of his colleagues and two people are at home, are those two people from home, are, are they gonna feel disconnected? So I think that the notion of collaboration is gonna be one of those things that's gonna be really uh, critical to get right and enabling people 
at home with the right technology, as well as enabling the office with the right technology to make sure that there aren't those breakdowns. But um, as one that, that has a massive case of FOMO and has for years, I think that there could be this situation in the next couple of years where the people that are choosing to be home start to feel like they're missing out on opportunities and conversations and those subtle connection points that for industries like ours collectively probably lead to a lot of the best ideas that mm -hmm. come out of a work year. Um, so, uh, you know, we're still, in, as I said, in, in the mid innings of figuring it all out. Um, and I think that it's going to be a bit industry specific. I think you're going to see some of the tech companies pushing the limits more so than the professional services companies. Um, it, I think it's going to take a couple of years for it all to shake out. Um, I can tell you one thing I know for certainty is that nobody's going to get it right. And pre pandemic, nobody got it right. And to Julia's point, we were having a lot of these conversations that we're having now uh, through a different lens of utilization and recruiting and work-life balance. And we're just continuing to have these same conversations, but through the lens of COVID. Yeah, I, know, I certainly know, you know, within our, our own office, um, we're trying to find the right balance, you know, of, of days in and days off and, and really um, working at the moment with a, a kind of hybrid model where we're in the office three days and, and working from home and sort of trying to leveraging the best of both of those scenarios with, you know, heavy collaboration focus on the days that we're in the office and, and more of a kind of heads down quiet work. Um, and, you know, I, as I, I agree, it's going to be industry specific. I mean, that certainly works for an architecture company that had needs, you know, heads down production work sometimes and highly collaborative meetings other times. Um, I think that the notion of hybrid though is, is I, mean, I think most companies are going to realize that they are a hybrid company. Um, and that's cute, but what does that actually mean? You know, I think that hybrid is, uh, is much more of an operating principle than it is a strategy. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I really think that the, the architects, the brokers, the workplace strategists of the world are gonna be able to help these companies kind of make sense of that. And what we're seeing in our client level is it really boils down to um, analyzing down to the employee level of who they are, where they are, what they do, what their manager looks for out of their specific type of work and whether or not they would qualify as a, as a remote employee or they even want to be a remote employee. So I do think that it's, it's pushing companies to really get granular on who their people are and what they do and what function they may serve in the office or out of the office, as opposed to the one size fits all. Hey, you're an employee in Boston. You have a desk in Boston. Mm -hmm. well, speaking of workplace strategists, I, I was wanting to ask Patricia um, you know, as someone who really focuses on workplace design and uh, academic as, as well, um, you know, what, what you're seeing, um, I know Brian mentioned a few things that I think pr probably are part of your workplace mm -hmm. design strategies going forward, but um, curious to know sort of how you're seeing some of these trends start to influence design thinking and what implications or opportunities there might be with that at higher ed institutions. Yeah, I think it's a great topic. And I think Julia and Brian brought some really relevant points to the forefront. I think this idea of designing for uncertainty um, brings people in security, right? That's a lot of why many of us are on this call. they like, what does the future look like? And a lot of folks come to us and say, what does the future workplace look like? Well, like who has the crystal ball and how can we use data to help inform that? And I think to Brian's point, again, some of the old models of thinking that got us where we are now aren't serving us so well when we're thinking of the workplace in the future. So um, I think a lot of what we brought to this idea of looking for the mythical average learner, the mythical average educator, the mythical average employee, and looking what that means. And the pandemic has really touched us all in very different ways. Um, and I think within organizations and having clarity of that. And to Julia's point initially, this idea of well-being um, is becoming really coming to the forefront as an operative model of thinking so that we're thinking not only beyond people's physical well-being, but there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of people, emotional health has come to the forefront and they're now now has to kind of go beyond some of the stigma around some of these things and talk about some of these softer aspects more intentionally and how the design of the spaces um, and 
and the ecosystem of how we're thinking of space allows us to address that. So a lot of what we're starting to do is trying to make some of these things about well-being feel less um, ethereal and just a little bit more tactical and tangible and capturing from a full range of users. What has their current experience been like in terms of, you know, how is their sense of belonging? How are you feeling about these various components? And then balancing. So that's what you're seeing in the lighter green um, image here. And then in the darker color, we're capturing for, for folks, what matters most to you? So of all these things and given your current experience, what is it the feeling of you? And in that gap, that really becomes this critical operative space where we have in some ways, the lowest hanging fruit, but also the most impactful interventions in their understanding um, for that specific context and within that specific organization. What, where are those gaps? And it's looked really different um, across different organizations and the spectrum of individual answers has also looked very different. So I think you can, there's no need to keep the um, image up, thanks. You can just kind of talk a little bit to each other, but this idea of how do, whose voices are we capturing and Whose well-being are we designing for? And I think it gets a little bit to this idea that folks have very different expectations of what, about what that ideal future looks like, and how do you bring this idea of designing to the edges um, to this conversation? And who and reframing? I think a lot of what we're designing for, right? It's been a big piece of where we talk about equity and we talk about inclusive design, but really pushing those boundaries. How do you design for the introvert and for the extrovert? Um, and pushing some of those conversations. And I think it gets very tactable to space. So some parts of this feels more like I'm talking about a poem, but a little, I think it gets down to like how we think about some of these hot topics, such as faculty offices. Um, I think understanding that there's a functional need for a space for research and space for focus and a space for that. Um, as we've been hearing about some student perspective, as the office is a space to meet for faculty to meet with students with this lens of well-being. A lot of what we're hearing, we're hearing about this idea of equity of power. How do you walk into a space where you feel comfortable? There's a co-creation of space and people feel both feel there's an equity. And the value of being having an outside space where you're able to have some of those student faculty engagements and shift some of those dynamics and allow for the, and I think Zoom in many ways has shifted some of these dynamics. It's like, oh, I'm talking to like my professor and I'm doing it from home and it has shifted a lot of those conversations and allowed for, a possibility that things could look different. And sometimes after you've experienced something that's different, you can't really go back to unseeing that. And you've said like, oh, it doesn't have to be that way. And if in some of the institutions where we've seen that happen, what happens is that sometimes that student who's more of an introvert, who maybe didn't feel comfortable scheduling that conversation with a professor, sees the classmate talking to the professor and joins the conversation. So it's a lot for different dynamics as we're thinking of the faculty workspace more holistically and as a system. But I think also recognizing when we talk about academic workspace, there's at least three very distinct spaces that have very different needs and are looking to solve very different problems, right? So in terms of the faculty workspace where the day is very structured around teaching and research and student engagement, but then when you have the student facing support services and then the non-student facing mm -hmm. staff spaces. And these are very different systems. And we kind of tend to both of what does the academic workplace look like? And I think these pieces and even the corporate workplace in its own mind is looking to solve different problems. Think what success looks like. Corporate workplace needs it to be very fluid, right? We need, we rely on a space where your day is all broken up. You have a meeting, then you run into someone in the hallway, you have a conversation, your focus work is all chunked up. Every day relies on that fluidity between work modes versus the faculty workspace, which is a lot more structured in your day. So how space supports the different needs. And just to add another example in terms of the space, when we're talking about um, student facing um, workspaces, a lot of what the pandemic exacerbated is the idea of choice. Um, and how do you allow for student choice in this world? And how do you, especially when we start talking about mental health services and stigma, and while some students really feel huge advantage of being able to walk into a space that they're away from home and have be able to engage in that. Also others who feel like I love how the Zoom call, I can, I can do it from my dorm room and I'm being able to engage it in a different way. So I think this idea of choice when it's, we're thinking about the workspace and then what that means ultimately, I think we can, some of the tendencies what we see in the workspace will start reflecting. I would imagine offices will tend to get smaller as their functions get more prescriptive. A lot of what we're hearing a lot of faculty say is that they do like to be able to work from home some days of the week for some portions of their day. When we say hybrid, you know, it just means that maybe this morning I'll stay home, I'll focus on my research and then I'll head into the office and I'll head into the space and do different things. So um, smaller and fewer offices, um, definitely like in terms of a concrete like, strategy of what that seems. So I think what we're seeing is 
the same way the pandemic has hit individuals in very different ways, it's also hit industries in very different ways. And it's interesting to hear um, Julia's stats and I'll just compare a little bit to what we've been hearing in terms of just like hearing what has worked and what hasn't. So when we asked uh, both corporate um, workplace employees and educators around satisfaction with the current pandemic experience, this is like saying, how satisfied are you with this fully remote experience. We heard 42% of employees, and this was um, maybe around December, just because it varies a lot, right? Said, we are very satisfied with working from home. And we heard 28% of faculty say, we are very satisfied with working from home. And this corresponds to what we're hearing from students that the pandemic has really hit the academic space in a very different way, and perhaps in a very more brutal way, um, especially if you talk about undergrads, um, than it did to the workplace. But, and so, which, and I think this creates a contradiction to the next question we asked them, what does the future look like? Say, so what does your ideal future look like if you can have the choices? And 52% of um, employees in the corporate workplace said, you know, it looks hybrid. And I think to my shock and surprise, a staggering 78% of faculty said it looks hybrid. So while I think the resolution is that, you know, while all remote, may not work. And hybrid means anything from one to four days in the office. So just we're defining what that means. And it might be very chunked up. It might be the morning here and an evening here. There's a very different definition of what hybrid means. But I think the future campus workplace, and I think this is true for faculty, for student-facing staff spaces, and for non-student-facing staff spaces, is unquestionably um, hybrid. And there's a lot of um, to know, a balance of remote and in-person. And again, to, I think ultimately to Brian's point, just to kind of hint, wrap this up, is that the idea that there is no space that will prove your success. There's no architect that's gonna be able to come in and say, this is a space, you're all set now, you can go. <laughs> it is a system, you know, it's an ecosystem and it hinges on what are the policies to support that mode of working? What's the culture, which means what are all the unwritten policies that support that work? And then was how is technology really supporting that? And I think we're having a lot of conversations about what is the future of technology of looking at to allow for that equity in that conversation for someone who's in the room and someone who's not. And does that mean this person is like blown up bigger than life um, so that they kind of make up for their lack of access in the space? And there's lots of different studies around that piece. Yeah. But um, this idea that when we're thinking about the workplace, that it's not only a place or a space, but it has to be thought more systemically in terms of the policies, the culture and the technology, I think is really critical. And um, I know John's been doing some work with that. So I'm also excited to hear how that is going as well as we continue this conversation. Yeah, uh, definitely. And, and I'm, I was glad that you kind of brought up the distinction of the different kinds of workplace spaces that you find in academia. And, um, you know, certainly the faculty offices, I'm sure everyone in this audience is probably, <laughs> yeah, hot topic. Maybe a you know sacrilege you can't go there, but I mean it's I would imagine for the planners in our group there's there's a sense of opportunity there of something that was always kind of memorialized. You can't touch it; it's got to be. Um, but also I think of the kind of rear facing student service spaces, and from an opportunity standpoint, you know the kind of if more remote working, if more hybrid impacts those um, functions, those workplace functions you know, what becomes of those spaces? How can a campus be nimble and respond to kind of programmatic demands that are more student-centric um, without necessarily increasing their footprint? You know, that always struck me as, as one of the kind of opportunities that might come out of this shift in workplace and perhaps, you know, more hybrid, smaller offices um, that allows them to be a bit more nimble, so. Um, I would love to know, you know, as, as John is um, representing MIT and, and we've, we've talked some, I know that, that he is, is leading a group that's really em, embarked on um, a discovery of, of how this real workplace shift is, is going to affect them going forward. So uh, John, I'd love to have you share some of that with our group today. Okay, so uh, thanks. Um... First off, we're not touching faculty offices. If any faculty <laughs> are on the call, um, the the um, so the MIT, you know that the, we've we've uh, all the administrative uh, units 
uh, all have been working remotely since since March of last last year. Um, we're uh, and, and remarkably successfully to to today, and so it's clear that there's you know it's possible now, uh, and that there's a shift, and um, you know we have MIT has hundreds of thousands of square feet. Of, uh, of of administrative staff in uh, rental space. Much of that is in Kendall, and we're finding, you know, as we go back to renew those le leases, we're the victim of our own success, right? We we've created this tremendous innovation economy, um, and so now the cost of those leases are triple what they they used to be, and and, the, and it's really raising our eyes to the extent that pre-pandemic. We were looking at building a, you know, administrative office building because it would have clearly paid for itself in very short order, rather than renew all these leases at the current rate. So when the pandemic uh, hit and we found that actually we can work from home and it's not so bad and it is productive, um, you know, people started to say, well, what is the space play here? But where MIT is right now is not about the space plan. We're not talking about space uh, at, at all. Uh, it's very much an HR play. So we've hired um, not an architect and not uh, to, to look at the to how we're going to work or what our spaces are going to be like. We hired uh, Deloitte, a big four public accounting firm, uh, in, a, in a program called Work Succeeding. And they're helping us through extensive series of interviews, through uh, focus groups, through surveying, broadcasting a broad net and a very intensive effort uh, to discover and uh, uh, what you know what 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 works and what doesn't work, and how do people work? What do they need? And coming out of that, we hope to have a, a toolkit, um, some policies, as, as uh, Patricia was, was mentioning, uh, and, and, and guidelines uh, around remote work. I mean, we, we did allow uh, you know remote work before, but it certainly wasn't as prevalent as we anticipate it will be in the future. And 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 and. and tools. So what are the tools that we need? It's, it's not just Zoom, you know, it's Zoom and Slack, and but there's a whole mess of tools that we need. And I, I think, uh, um, you know, we talked earlier in the conversation about how do we make the folks who are participating, made, participating in the meeting from home feel as, uh, uh, as included as those who are, you know, gathered around the conference table in the, in the office in the same meeting. So so what we're trying to do is, is give all our departments and labs and centers, all the administrative folks within that, tools, guidance, and policies uh, around, around you know, this remote uh, work arrangement. And then each is going to really sh sort of shape as we you know, approach September when we're you know, officially welcomed back to campus, um, uh, how, how that works. Now, there's going to have to be some guardrails around that because I think everybody would say, okay, great, we'll work Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We've, we've um, uh, until there's confidence in, in the uh, um, mass transit system again, everyone's driving. And we've, you know, we have been very aggressive in reducing our parking count. And in fact, our, you know, MIT IDs give us access to uh, the whole MBTA system. Uh, for free, and that's a that's a benefit that MIT pays for, but pays for it because they, you know, it's a part of our our greenhouse gas initiative. It's it's part of you know just reducing the amount of traffic in Cambridge. But right now, you know, that confidence isn't there. And if everyone came to work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in their car, you don't have enough parking spaces for them all. <laughs> so we're we're going to have to, you know, there, there will have to be some some guardrails we put around this. So that not all the DLCs agree to the to the same kinds of things. Um, we're also looking at you know benefits. So you know 
maybe it's not such great benefit now that we have access to uh, the Z Center, our gym. You know, if you're working remotely, that may not really seem like much of a benefit anymore. Um, also, uh, compensation. So we can now maybe uh, attract the best talent, but do we have to pay someone who's in Montana the same as we pay for someone who's, you know, living in Cambridge? So these are all the kinds of things that we're trying to sort out and focus through uh, and, and talk through and understand better and understand what, uh, uh, you know, what environment is going to accommodate this, this, this broader set of, of flexible work uh, arrangements and, and what's the work setting are going to look like before we even wade into the, the actual space play of it. So we're, 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 you know, deeply embroiled in that exercise. Now it's kind of a, a moonshot. It's, it's so many people are involved and it's, it's a very, on a very aggressive timeline. Um, but that's where we're at. This is for us right now, building a program, understanding how people work, and then phase two will be what is the physical manifestations of that and what does it mean for, for our, our space? Yeah, it's really kind of fascinating to, to think of, you know, again, we're, we're often very much um, addressing space and fixated on, on space needs and to um, sort of see how your exploration of this issue really backed it up even further to kind of Patricia's point earlier that, that this is part of a, a broader system. You know, the space plays a piece, you know, in a role that, that involves broader. And to, to kind of bring it back to Julia, I, you know, I wonder, I think some of my early questions were kind of about the space and the disposition from the corporate side in regards to that. But um, are, are you hearing, um, you know, how they're addressing some of the concerns that John is, is, is wrestling with and looking into at MIT. Yeah. I mean, everybody's commentary was so interesting and, you know, I think it's important and, and Brian mentioned this, a lot of our surveys are also, although we're seeing data come out through them, we're also noting that there's still a lot of uncertainty because it is a people um, kind of discussion first. And then once you understand how people are going to interact with the space, then you can start to make decisions. You know, I think um, I think we're having a conversation today, and if we were having a conversation five years ago, or ten years ago, or twenty years ago, there would be different trends. And I think we have to go through the exercise of actually living through what a, a new work model um, looks and feels like. But I think, you know, two things, and this goes back to the the organizational point that Patricia made. A lot of the conversations we're having and have had in the past is around change management and how do you get people over the mental hurdle of just changing the way that they're doing things and you know creating that culture and those unspoken policies where everybody understands what the expectations are without necessarily um, you know needing it to be outlined in print um, you know, the change management part right now is, I think, the biggest and most important piece of this puzzle. We've all been operating for 12 months in one way, and that's largely been working from home. And if you look at, and there, the, the Power of Habit, that book that came out um, not long ago, and, and the study of forming good habits, you can, you can form a new habit anywhere between three weeks and six months. Well, we're 12 months into this, so you have to imagine everybody's formed completely different habits at this point. So you have to start preparing them for the shift in, you know, whether or not they will come back to work or they'll stay remaining at home. Um, you know, the, that's part of the, the progression of this. And I loved what everybody said about, you know, flexibility and, you know, looking back at research that we were conducting in 2016, a lot of the results were finding that People wanted autonomy. That's significant. You know, we think about how people stay engaged with their companies. It's around having good managers and a good culture. And, and you can utilize the workspace to create some of those managerial policies or experiences by offering a choice in where people are working if they're in the space, is it collaboration space, is it private space? So I do think that there are a lot of opportunities to you know, look ahead as Patricia was saying and, 
and how can we do things better and continue to evolve? And, and five years from now, we'll have new learnings and 10 years from now, we'll have new learnings and this will continue to be an evolution that's not going to be static. I love this conversation. It's been, you know, it's very insightful and it's refreshing to be able to kind of, again, get, get such a variety of perspectives here that we have in the group. Um, I do want to make sure that we have some time. There are some questions from the audience that I wanted to um, introduce. Um, Leslie had asked, um, is any research being done about assigned seating versus unassigned seating in workplace environments? Yeah, I just can't help that there's, I think there's a lot of research on that. It's a particularly challenging time. I think for anything, for research and surveys to be informed in the future. Just want to put that out there in the first place because the context with which we're surfing is constantly changing, where what state the person's in is constantly changing. And what informs your prediction analytics is oftentimes, sometimes it's based on aspirations and sometimes it's based on fear. Um, and I think that has really shifted a lot of the conversation, specifically on assigned and unassigned seating. So you might see a bigger tendency as you look through the months as COVID has evolved, where people are more comfortable with unassigned seating and how that's reflected on their understanding of safety and what health this looks like and what well-being looks like. So it is a piece that is really difficult to survey folks now in April if we're making predictions for people to come back in the fall. Because in the fall, yeah. someone who answered something in April might feel very differently about that situation. So it's a tricky piece, I think, to make. Um, and I think that is where it goes. Uh, to Brian's point, a little bit about designing for flexibility and designing for a space that's able to learn from itself. So I think in terms of data analytics and predictive analytics, which you know everyone wants predictive analytics right now, like the future is so uncertain, that the more robust piece is a space that's able to provide for continuous learning, where you're able to be continuously tracking how space is being used and making adjustments and accommodations. And I think again, to John's point around how policies and culture are able to evolve to allow for that framework and that footprint to allow for that accommodation to happen. Because I think as we've seen, this, you know, predicting the future has never been easy, but I think it's never been harder. Um, so a designing for a way that data is helping you even once you're back in the office to see how that's working and being continuously tracking is more useful than a lot of these um, questions now as people are projecting far into the future within a context that's ever changing. Um, there was actually another question for Patricia. Um, this is from David um, and it's regarding the um, campus planners. Do we know what type of faculty you've, you've canvassed? Uh, an example, mm -hmm. full-time faculty member may answer a question about remote learning very differently than a part-time slash adult faculty member. Many PT faculty mm -hmm. have been working in a more dynamic fluid mode well before COVID. So he wonders if we as planners and designers need to make those think distinctions to better understand best practices. Great point, absolutely agree. Just to answer the question specifically, this was a nationwide panel survey with um, 2,500 students and over 500 educators, kind of sort of random. The result, we're just distilling the results. So I just give, I give you the sample peak. Gensler hasn't even re released this yet. We're releasing this in May. So this is just like a little bit of a sneak peek of what we're seeing. Any survey results that tells you the average of what everybody thought is not gonna be useful to predicting individuals or, or in specific departments where a department's going. I think it just helps us frame a little bit of what the questions we should be asking and gives us some perhaps some big picture questions saying like, oh wow, there's a shift in this direction I had not anticipated, let's dig deeper into it. I think you can't plan based on a nationwide survey, right? That's like, that's already a given, I think within any context and organization and with the result for that specific context has to be so specific and bespoke to that organization and to, the, and, and to that group and what that culture looks like and all those pieces. So um, I think definitely agree that it, it will be specific. And I think um, Brian mentioned this a little bit more. More and more we're looking at at a granular level of what that individual means and what those individual needs are. And again, I think that's where data helps us do some of these conversations, have these conversations where, you know, we tend to say like, okay, so what's happening? Is it going this way or that way? And when it gets a little bit more complicated and it gets a little bit more granular, and some are going this way and some are going the other way, we're like, let's average it. And that feels like the wrong mindset to go about it and just say like, how can we look at this more granularly and make sense of that granular data? to inform very specific, but still changeable um, spaces and policies, right? It's worth noting, I think it's spot on, but I think it's, it's all, we need to emphasize that it is a moment in time. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, 
what's critical to the evolution of this is that we continue to track it through a lot of the data and technology platforms that are going to emerge as real solutions for our clients coming through this. Um, because if we make static uncertain decisions right now and don't actually have the data, because we're all trying to rely on this employee data now to, to drive decisions so we don't have continue a continuation of that data to support whether they were the right decisions or not and, and put flexibility and modularity into our systems that can allow us to move based on what that data is telling us, then we've had our clients spend a lot of money on workplace strategy. No, no offense, Patricia, but we're not actually getting the net result that we could if we continue to evaluate how this is going down the road. So, I think, yeah. Absolutely. The data collection, the continuous, like this idea of continuous learning from the space, I think is what, where workplace strategy is headed. I think we have time for maybe one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Um, Bob Hicks has asked, have we seen the end of the large slope floor lecture hall? I mean, if I may answer again with a percentage, which, you know, as we all discussed, it doesn't answer questions. Uh, what we saw is that only 37% of these, you know, 2,500 students that we had said that they would be interested in coming back to campus for a lecture. This is a balance of community college, graduate and undergraduate students. So again, um, and definitely the lecture will always be, right? The one, if you look at all the learning modes, what's the thing you could be happy to do from home and the advantage in terms of equity and like the closed captioning and a lot of these things. Um, so is it the end of it? But there's also, I think, a part of legacy. And I think sometimes we forget some of these imports of like, you know, when you're designing for something and saying like, I'm in a big lecture hall and what that experience of, I think a lot of what we're seeing is there's a functional need for things, but there's also an emotional and cultural need for things and being part of a big lecture hall where you sit in the middle of hundreds of other students who just came in and you're a freshman is an experience that a lot of people aren't willing to give up. So it's a balance, I think, again, of it's not only function. This is a lot of what we're seeing. So I would answer that it's not the end of the slope lecture hall, maybe fewer of them, but not the end. Um, Thanks, Patricia. Um, Let's see, it's 12.52. There is one more uh, question, and this is really for, for John um, on, um, you know, your engagement with Deloitte and uh, whether or not that, that happened before or after the pandemic. What was it about Deloitte that really, um, that, you know, attracted you guys to, to use them for this kind of guidance? What did they bring to the table? Um, you know, I... I can't say specifically I wasn't uh, a part of the uh, selection process. The, it was a very competitive selection process. There was first sort of a, uh, a net cast amongst a, a, a kind of different uh, set of, of uh, folks like uh, design firms, uh, you know, big consultancies and, uh, and, and real estate firms and sort of uh, the, the sort of a solicitation of interest and sort of uh, also saying, how would we go about procuring these services? What would an RFP look like? And, and based on those responses, as I understand, it was kind of called through to the candidates that they actually went out to. And, the, and, and those candidates, um, there were some design firms in that, in that candidate mix, um, but they're mo mostly consultancies. Um, and because they were really, really looking at the data gathering, the, uh, the, the, the workplace, the performance, uh, the, um, you know, how productive uh, uh, one is in that environment. Um, and, and so that, um, you know, the teams that were finalists that came into interview all had different perspectives on it. They, they all had a a wide range of fees that they would charge for for that work because it's so kind of so open ended and not really understood what what would be um, what would mean to, to to deploy that. But I think as the you know the Deloitte team obviously pre presented the most convincing case that they could pull this together for us in a very short period of time. I mean, we started this in March and by uh, June they want to start. Uh, Rolling out some of these uh, some of these guidelines, and I guess that that their their work performance group had uh, had a great great deal of experience uh, in, in these topic areas. Certainly not 
uh, as a result of the, the pandemic, but in those specific topic areas about tech, technology tools for collaboration, performance development tools, compensation, um, and, and the like. Thanks, John. Um, well, I think that given the time, um, we'll probably wrap up our discussion there. I wanted to let everyone in the audience know that the session is being recorded and it will be available um, to access on the BSA website. If you want to come back and, and hear it again, share with your colleagues. Um, I want to say thank you again to our panelists today. I appreciate all the the time um, that you put in and, and all the great insight that you were able to share with us today. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. And, and uh, thank you to you, Michael, and, and to all the panelists. And I just wanted to mention a couple upcoming programs on April 21st, our committee in partnership with the BSA Committee on the Environment has a program on net zero energy plans at Amherst Colby and Dartmouth Colleges in May. Well, we're planning a program on outdoor environments and also a second program on the future of learning. June, in co collaboration with the BSA Equity, Diversion and Inclusion on Campus Committee, uh, we have a, a program uh, with an emphasis on student housing. And July 11th to 13th, the SCUP National Conference hybrid styles in, in Philadelphia and online. Uh, thank you again, everyone for attending. And um, I, have been, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. It was a great, great program. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Thank you all.